One of the most effective Christian evangelists of 19th century America was not an ordained minister. He was an ordinary layman named Dwight L. Moody. Born on a New England farm in 1837, Moody received no formal education, yet while still a young man, he achieved enduring fame as an orator and preacher. Dwight L. Moody did not look the part. Short, bearded, heavy-set man, so retiring he seemed almost timid. That is, he appeared so until he began to speak. Then the sincerity and the conviction of faith brought a miraculous change. He radiated confidence and strength, and one of his favorite passages of Scripture was the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be saved. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall attain to mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall be God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they which have persecuted for righteousness. Dwight L. Moody shared his successful crusading with another evangelist, a minister of music named Ira Sankey. Within a few years, the team of Moody and Sankey was known and loved around the Christian world, and one of the reasons for its phenomenal success was Mr. Sankey's voice. The song is ended, but the melody lingers on. Through this recording made in 1899, Ira Sankey singing, God Be With You. William A. Sunday, better known as Billy. Billy Sunday brought a dynamic new approach to evangelism in the early part of this century. When Billy Sunday faced a congregation, he didn't orate, speak, or preach. He exploded. His zeal for fighting sin was boundless, especially when the devil's advocate was liquor, or as Billy called it, booze. on the regulations of the sale of liquor. If we must have booze, well, let's sell it in the saloons where it belongs. That's where it belongs. 
government regulation of booze has always been worse than what was in the sale of private hands. For what was in the sale of private hands, they kept in the saloon where it belonged. What difference does it make whether a man guzzles beer standing at the bar or whether sitting down at a table? Booze sold to a preacher or a high school girl has the same effect as when it's sold to an automobile thief or a horse thief. Congress has passed a law putting $2 a tax on whiskey and they expect to realize $300 million. That means that the American people have got to buy and drink 150 million gallons a year. They have put $5 a, a barrel tax on beer. That means the people have got to buy and drink 32 million barrels of beer a year. It doesn't take a lawyer to figure out that if you do that, you take that much money out of the legitimate channels of trade. You spend that much less for food and clothes and boots and shoes and education. Very few. Very few evangelists of the past 10 decades were more diligent or tireless than William Bell Riley. He founded the Northwestern Bible Training School and an evangelical seminary. He also served as pastor of the First Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota for more than 40 years. William Riley authored numerous scholarly texts on Christian evangelism, but his most effective form of communication was the anecdote or the human interest story. He relates a personal soul-winning experience in the only extant recording of his voice. Twelve years went by, and I had a most astonishing and beautifully written letter one day, signed by that same boy. And he said, since you talked with me that day, I have been a Christian. And I'm happy now to tell you also that since that time, I've not only finished the high school and the university course, but I've taken a course also in theology. And today, I am the pastor of such and such a colored church in Texas. The church was a prominent one. As I have reflected upon the fact that it only required a few minutes that day of my time and years, I confess very frankly, I often hang my head in shame that I have not put in more such times with people of possible conversion. And my George W. Truitt, beloved pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, from 1897 to 1944. George W. Truitt combined a warm and vibrant personality with scholarly evangelism. Revered, respected, and honored during his lifetime, Dr. Truitt's magnetic voice continues his deathless ministry through the medium of countless recorded sermons. A rare excerpt from one of these underscores the true meaning of personal success. Now, to go against him means that you're not succeeding, that you're not succeeding. What is success? Success is recognizing the will of God and trying to do it the best you can. He doesn't succeed, you forget that. He may have a bank full of gold. He doesn't succeed, you forget that. Success! Your success is the phantasm of success, the sarcasm of success, utter futility, defeat. If you're leaving the Lord out of your plan, he wants to be your master. And then he says, I'll turn your life into a great triumph scene. If you're in the world 40 or 50 years or up to 70 or 80 or even reach the century mark, I'll make the flowers to bloom in your path. I'll make the music to echo in your ears. I'll make your heart to join in the glorious chorus of music to the effect that God's grace and sufficient grace is sufficient for you. And then when the time comes for you to pass, from the earthly sphere to the land beyond, I'll be there at the depot of death waiting for you. And I'll come by you myself. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You need to be afraid about when or where or how you'll go. The automobile may get you, the wreck may get you, the illness may get you, but remember, whenever the time comes, I'll be at the depot for you, and I myself will convoy your crop, and there'll be no trouble. And then in the land beyond, when all are assembled before the bar of Christ for final reckoning, I'll be there to take the place and to make the defense for everyone who's put his trust in me. I used to be when a lad frightened well nigh to death at the thought of that judgment day of our Lord. As he sits upon his throne and before him shall be gathered all nations. And uh, we shall make our account one by one to that great and omniscient judge. I used to be terrorized beyond words. No more of that now. I put my case in my attorney's hand. My attorney is Christ. If any man sin, we have an advocate, an attorney, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I put the case in his hand. Manage it, I can't manage it. Take care of me, I can't take care of myself. Save me, I can't save myself. Keep me, I can't keep myself. And he answers back, I'll forgive, and I'll save, and I'll guide, and I'll keep, and I'll be with you living. Historians of religion. Historians of religious life in America during the last 10 decades have noted the marked individualism of our evangelical leaders. Each man was different. No two were alike. The only characteristics they possessed in common were sincerity, love of Christ, and a boundless enthusiasm for winning souls. An outstanding example was Dr. Harry Ironsides, for many years the pastor of the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago. Like St. Paul, the first evangelist, Dr. Ironsides believed that every encounter with his fellow man, no matter how casual, was an opportunity for Christian conversion. And he demonstrated this truth through real-life experiences of his own. When the train pulled in, I walked through the uh, day coach, and I found there was just a half of one seat vacant, and a man was sleeping on the other half. So I sat down there. I was very much exercised in my soul, I felt there must have been some reason why God had allowed me to miss that train. I believed implicitly, as I still believe, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. And so I felt that he had someone on that train with whom he wished me to speak. I wondered if it could be the sleeping man beside me. I say sleeping, but the fact is that he roused himself just as I sat down. And he greeted me, and uh, we exchanged a few words, and then were silent for a time, and finally he woke completely up, and we began to talk together. And all the time I was praying, Lord, if thou hast something for this man, may I not miss the opportunity, but give me just the right message for him. Finally, as we talked along, I put the question straight to him. Now, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? He roused himself up and uh, said to me, it's a remarkable thing that you should ask me that question. He said, you know, sir, I've been so anxious about this matter of salvation for some days that I've been working in a lumber mill down in the southern part of the state, and uh, some folks were having revival meetings nearby, and I went over to the services, and uh, I was quite impressed by the preaching and uh, felt that I was a sinner and needed a savior. And night after night, I went out to the mourner's bench, but somewhere or another, I couldn't seem to get anything clear. You know, as I dropped off to sleep in the train tonight, I was wishing I could talk with someone who could make the way of salvation plain. Well, of course, it was a delight to take out my Bible and turn from passage to passage and show that young man just how he might find peace with God. And uh, finally, as we turn to some of the great salvation verses of the New Testament, the light broke upon his soul, and he said, Oh, I see it, yes, Christ died for me, and if I trust him as my Savior, then uh, the matter is settled. I said, Yes, that's it. Well, he said, I do trust him. I can take him now. 
And we bowed our heads together, and he thanked God for his saving grace, and I thanked him for giving me the privilege of being his messenger to that earnest young man. We talked together for perhaps an hour or so, and then he came to the place where he was to leave the train. I bade him goodbye and went on my journey northward. For two or three years after that, I heard from him every little while, and it was delightful to see how he seemed to be growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why am I telling you this story? Well, just for this reason. I'm wondering if it might not reach someone who, like that young man, is asking, how may I be saved? I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is deeply interested in you. He's longing to see you. On a rain-swept morning, On a rain-swept morning, January 1889, a transatlantic ship from England docked in New York Harbor. One of the passengers, a stocky young man with swarthy complexion, piercing black eyes, and a shock of dark hair, was visiting America for the first time. There were no reporters, no church dignitaries, no welcoming committees to greet him that day because Gypsy Smith was unknown in New York, or almost anywhere else for that matter. Yet within a short space of one year, countless thousands of people in mission houses, churches, and tabernacles from Boston to San Francisco had thrilled to his trenchant sermons and gospel singing. The name Gypsy Smith became almost as common as Uncle Sam. When that initial visit was over, he went back to his native England. But during the next two decades, Gypsy Smith returned to tour the United States many times. He was a powerful speaker and an inspired singer. And now his living voice is part of yesterday, but its recorded echo is with us still. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow. Gospel singing has always been a vital and integral part of evangelism. Both solo hymns and group singing by the congregation create a relaxed and pleasant atmosphere. But all music must be led or directed. Ira Sankey, Dwight L. Moody's choir director, was a large and dignified man, and his singing style matched his imposing appearance. Several years later, another and distinctly different song leader appeared at the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. He was Charles M. Alexander a smiling young man from Tennessee, smooth-shaven, 
He generally dressed in dark trousers, a long frock coat, white shirt, high collar, but there was nothing high collar about Alexander's personality. He loved a joke, and he liked to lead the congregation in lilting songs they could all sing together. Many of his gospel solos are classics in evangelistic songs. No one can ever forget Charles Alexander singing the glory song. Accepted. The acceptance of Jesus Christ as personal Savior is an experience that comes to different men in different ways. One snowbound night during the winter of 1897 in the slums of Chicago, a human derelict named Mel Trotter stumbled into the Pacific Garden Mission. Trotter was so drunk he didn't know his own name or where he was. Fortunately, the mission director knew exactly what to do. First, black coffee, a hot bath, clean clothes, and sleep. The recovery process took three days. At the end of that time, Mel Trotter, resentful and cold sober, prepared to resist the preaching accusations he thought were coming. But he was due for a surprise. There was no preaching or criticism. The mission director merely invited him to stay there as long as he liked. Trotter was dumbfounded. But within a week, by silent example, not by words, he had renounced his former life and had become a Christian. That was the beginning of Mel Trotter, the evangelist. He became a zealous worker. Within his lifetime, Mr. Trotter founded more than 67 city missions throughout the United States. One of his favorite sermon themes was Christ's forgiveness. For he was living proof that God will blot out all our sins. Verses 23 and 24 says, Thou hast not brought me, brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane for money. You know that candy, don't you? Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to stir with thy sin. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquity. And yet he detects, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I'll not remember your sin. Just to think, there is no prayer, no offerings, and no worship. Wearied him, no sacrifices, and yet he said, I'll forgive you. I blot out your transgressions. I do it for mine own sake, and I'll not remember thy sin. Now, if you wanted a real outline on this, I, I think this is one that you can never forget. And the way you can use it is, and get it is the way I got it. I got it when I heard a man use it once. They're blotted out from God's book. Second, they're blotted out with God's hand. Third, they're blotted out for his sake. Fourth, my sins are blotted out for his, from his memory. You see, that's great and cheering. Take it from God's book. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you today that uh, God keeps books like I used to think what he did when I was a boy. I used to think that every good thing I did would be put down and every bad thing I did would be put down. And then when I got ready to die, they'd add up the good ones and add up the bad ones and subtract the difference. And if I'd done more evil than good, I'd go to heaven. And if I did more, good, uh, more evil than good, I'd perish. And if I did it the other way, I'd go to heaven and so on. Well, now I know that isn't so. And yet, I tell you, God keeps books. God knows you, and God knows even the thought and the intent of the heart. 
a boy in Chicago confessed to this, a friend of his the killing of his father and mother. Old Mike Shack over in the North Ave in the Chicago Avenue, the East Chicago Avenue station, had a 15-minute dictaphone, four of them in a room. And when he told his sweetheart how he killed his father and mother and where he buried that money, they uh, come back the next Tuesday when he pled not guilty, and they set that thing a-going, and he heard his own voice. His own words convicted him. And then there on the table was that tin box where he'd and with the money in it, where he told his friend, uh, that lovely girl, that Christian girl that loved him. And do you know, sir, she, he, they confronted him with the very box that they found where he had told this girl they were. You know, the funny thing about it, if, if Edison can do that, don't you think that God can do it? Every word, even the idle word. Now, science proves that. Dr. Chapman said to me one time in one owner, would you like to hear Sam Hadley sing? Why, I grinned at him. Sam had been dead six years, and yet he went and got out one of those old Edison cylinder phonographs, old scratchy thing, but he unwrapped, the, uh, uh, unwrapped it and put it on that thing, and I heard old Sam Hadley singing, oh, it is wonderful, very, very wonderful, yet he'd been dead six years. Why, you know, the funny thing about it, God keeps records as well as Edison can do it. It is the sin of your youth, the feeling, the anger, the thing that you know to be wrong. It's like soft cement. Thirty years ago, when Homer Hammontree down at Maryville uh, marked his name in, in that stuff, it's still there. I saw it uh, because it was put in soft cement. Now, if that is so, there's nothing but eternal punishment ahead of me. You see, but there's hope. There's hope in this text. I even, I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I'll not remember your sins. You see, it's a commercial... J. Wilbur Chapman was one of the truly great names in American evangelism. He achieved signal success in his chosen work for several different reasons. First, of course, was dedication and training. Chapman was a serious Bible student. He was graduated from Lake Forest College and Lane Seminary. Second, his innate understanding of human nature and his ability to inspire everyone who worked with him. He was the first evangelist to introduce definitive planning into soul-saving campaigns. However, J. Wilbur Chapman's Successful evangelism reached its greatest peak when he realized the full power of his organizational talent. He recognized Charles Alexander's unique ability as a song leader and put the young man to work. He also perceived Billy Sunday's potential power and gave that human thunderbolt his first opportunity to preach. J. Wilbur Chapman will be particularly remembered for his Bible readings. Scripture lesson, the Gospel according to St. Mark, fourth chapter, verses 35 to 41. And the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over on to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are... General... General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was truly a giant of modern evangelism. His Christian character, his strength, and his high ideals are all exemplified every day in the worldwide success of the Army. One of his own human interest sermons best illustrates the faith and power of General Booth. Some time ago, a steamer with a number of gold miners on board was seen approaching San Francisco. The voyage had been delightful, and all were in high speed. 
at the near prospect of home. Suddenly, a fierce day, he drove the vessel onto a rock, and the captain announced that the ship was sinking while he spoke. On the deck, a sunburnt miner was buckling around his waist in golden baby. When a little lassie of seven summers came along, and looking up into his face, asked the question, Please, sir, can you swim? Yes, said the miner, I reckon so. Then please, sir, ask the child with fearful eyes, Will you save me? Quick as thought, the miner saw that he could not save the child and his money as well, but he soon decided, and overboard went the gold. Creep up, my darling, put your arms round me neck tight, and the next moment he was grabbing the little legs where a few seconds before he had been fastening the gold. Then plunging into the billow, he swam and swam until a big wave landed him on the shore. They bore him to a cottage, and opening his eyes, he asked, Where am I? When the same little form, creeping up his bosom, kissed him on both cheeks and said, Please, sir, I'm so glad you saved me. All around you on the waste waters of life, in their poverty, miseries, and sins, the people are seeking. Will you help them? Seek neither money, pride, or self. Far the way overboard with it. Put your trust in God. Throw your arms round the very king and swim and swim until by and by when the kindly hand of A substantial portion of the phenomenal success of Billy Sunday the Evangelist was due to his choir director, or song leader, Homer Rodeheaver. More than any other director before or after him, Homer Rodeheaver perfected the technique of effective gospel singing and evangelism in revival meetings. Mr. Rodeheaver was also an accomplished instrumentalist. He played the trombone exceptionally well, and no one who ever saw the team of Sunday and Rodeheaver in action will ever forget the young man who led the singing. Fortunately, his inspired voice has been preserved. We want to tell you the story of a blind man, a blind man who sat by the way and cried. Dark, gloomy prospect to be blind. If you want to realize that, go to your own room. Shut your eyes just tightly as you can. Try to stumble around and find your own way. That'll give you a little bit of an idea of what it must have meant to this blind man when Jesus came by where he sat and touched his eyes and let him see the beauty of this world for the very, very first time. One sat alone beside the highway begging. His eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory for all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. So men today have found the Savior able they could not conquer passion, lust, and sin. Their broken hearts that left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away.
Half a century ago, one rainy day in Rogers, Arkansas, a 17-year-old wastrel boy followed a Salvation Army drum to the meeting house. Two hours later, young John Brown rose from his knees a dedicated Christian. Out of his conversion grew the mighty institutions of learning which today bear his name, John Brown University, Brown Military Academy, Southern California Military Academy, Brown School for Girls in California, the big bass drum echoes yet, and the big voice of a man who was such a capable custodian over a few things that God gave him dominion over many. Up to a certain point in history, the cross was looked on with fright, shuddering fear, that horrible instrument of human torture and human suffering. But the time came when almost overnight that cross was changed. Came a thing of power, a thing of beauty. Bless people, exalt people. What changed the cross? Greatest miracle in the history of the Christian faith. People say, well, Jesus of Nazareth died on that cross. Good man. But worlds and worlds of good people had been nailed to the cross. Prophets, priests had been nailed to the cross. Didn't change the cross. But the time came when something changed that cross. The miracle of our Christian faith. What was it? Let's go back again to the declaration that uh, a lot of us get the idea the devil rushed Christ to the cross. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Jesus fought, literally fought, to finish his journey, which was to end at the cross. Thus it must be. And you remember in Hebrews, seventh verse of the fifth chapter and I never try to quote that I always turn to read it I could quote it who in the days of his place talking about Christ when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears now this is the garden of Gethsemane scene with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, or as the American Revised puts it, having been heard for his godly fear. Now, angels came and strengthened Jesus. Otherwise, he would have died there of a broken heart. In fact, he died of a broken heart. When they shoved the spear in his side, nailed to the cross, there gushed forth water and blood, evidence that he died of a broken heart. But Jesus would have died there in the Garden of Gethsemane if angels had not come to strengthen him, that he might end his journey at the cross. What force, what power wrought the miracle of a changed cross? There's only one explanation, and that is the declaration of Paul that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. In other words, when the blood of Few ministers of the gospel have left so indelible a mark in the hearts and minds of a nation as a man called Peter, a Scotsman named Peter Marshall. As pastor of the New York Avenue Church in Washington, D.C., his sermons were quoted in every state in the Union. When he served as chaplain of the United States Senate, contemporary senators always made it a point to be on hand on time for his inspiring invocation. In January of 1949, his untimely death was mourned throughout the world. But the essence of Peter Marshall's ministry remains in all or any one of his recorded sermons. At the beginning of the war, there were two notable examples. You may remember the foundering of the Athenia and the loss of the city of Benares off the west coast of Africa. And at that time, one of the popular songs was, as you may remember, the Beer Barrel Polka. And we read, incredible as it seems, we read of survivors struggling in the water, crouched 
wet and shivering in lifeboats, singing together, roll out the barrel and we'll have a barrel of fun. One might wonder at the choice of a song. One might be aghast at the prospect of facing eternity to the strains of the beer barrel polka, but there is nevertheless something thrilling about the spirit that can sing at such a time, even although what they sing seems inane and strangely inappropriate. I have often thought what a startling contrast to another maritime disaster, which some of you will remember, in May 1912, when the Titanic went down. I was a very little boy then, but I can well remember the special editions of the papers and the magazines with their heavy black borders, describing the loss of this magnificent new ship, which men said could never sink. This floating palace was in collision with a floating mountain of ice, and icy knives ripped open a hull that was claimed to be unsinkable. And when the orchestra, which a few minutes before had been playing Strauss waltzes in the ballroom, gathered on the boat deck, and when the male passengers stood alongside to the cry women and children first, loading lifeboats, as many as could be lowered away, they waited patiently, hoping that there might be a chance of rescue, and then, when it appeared that none was likely, the orchestra began to play and they began to sing. But what did they sing? They sang, Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee, e'en though it be a cross that raises me, yet all my song shall be nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee, nearer to thee. Now, when you contrast that with roll out the barrel and we'll have a barrel of fun, you can see what has happened to a nation's faith. You can see what has happened to the faith of people in 30 years, can't you? Facing eternity to the strains of the beer barrel polka. Or lay that pistol down. Or mere the joke. What a commentary upon the faith of immortal souls. And yet the Stoic has always inspired us. Heroism, in the face of difficulty, has put backbone into many a man. So that if the oyster were to say, I'll never give in, I'll fight it out on this line. Though I'm bleeding and sore, yet I will never surrender. I must remember that the darkest hour is just before the dawn. I'll hang on. I say that's noble, it's thrilling, it's fine, it's magnificent. But it does not adequately deal with the problem. The grain of sand is still there. As a matter of fact, the oyster does none of these things. Because the oyster is at one and the same time a realist and an idealist. And you can be both. You must be both in times like these. You must be a realist and an idealist. And the Christian can be and must be both. The oyster knows with the profound wisdom that God gives to the humblest of his creatures that nothing is accomplished by rebellion against hard reality. The oyster knows that you can't deny a bleeding, stabbing pain in your side. You can't deny blood. The oyster knows that no amount of stoicism can ever make life comfortable again once a grain of sand has entered your shell. So what does the oyster do? The oyster begins carefully and patiently with infinite skill to deposit upon the quartz a milky substance which upon its sandy base is spun and wrapped in nature's magic to make of the grain of sand that for which divers are willing to risk their lives a pearl, a thing of beauty and hidden light, smooth and warm, wondrous beauty wrapped around trouble. Now let us then learn from the oyster. For life is a difficult game, and these are trying times. We have not yet begun to pay the cost of the war. There may be some in this very place, some within sound of my voice, who will be called upon to make the supreme sacrifice. There may be some who will be called upon to make a great renunciation, to lay upon the altar of patriotism that which they cherish most. 
There may be parents whose hearts have already begun to feel the pang of a separation that might last until the end of the trail because blue stars are turning into gold. Troubles may come that we know not of. Pain may come to us and grief, for many horrible things are possible and many horrible things are yet to happen. But if the blow should fall, it will not crush us nor lay us low. For remember, Ezekiel did not set himself upon his feet. He did not pull upon his own bootstraps to rise from dead horizontals. No, the Spirit of God raised him up. The Spirit of God entered into him. The Spirit of God came to him and changed.